Thank you, Warren. Good morning. It's a privilege, privilege to worship with you all this morning and the study of God's Word. And um, I am filling in for Mark Newman. Um, Mark Newman and Mike Black typically rotate. So for those visiting, don't let me scare you away. <laughs> Come back. I'm the bottom of the bucket here. Uh, but, uh, but here we are. Uh, uh, the spotlight is on the Word of God. And perhaps some are here this morning online, not able to join uh, uh, for various circumstances and uh, are listening uh, online. And uh, I want you to know it's, it's not easy to, to miss the fellowship of the saints. So um, we know your, your circumstances and where, where you really want to be. Um, and uh, I want you to know you're missed. And for those here, uh, welcome, welcome. This morning we'll be looking at a marvelous uh, messianic psalm, Psalm chapter 2. Um, it points to the future fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Um, we won't read that, but that's found if you wanted to earmark it for later. 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, specifically verses 11 through 16. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, we see that Davidic covenant given um, to David. Uh, my prayer this morning uh, for our time together is that the hearts of the saints would be edified as Warren prayed and encouraged, uh, strengthened in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope and confidence in him in this world um, that is characterized by chaos, it's not a, a hope that is a, a worldly hope, which is a wishful, uh, a wishful hope amid life's circumstances, but our hope in Christ is a confidence, a confidence in Christ, a tangible and experiential reality. Jesus comforts his disciples in John 16, verses 33, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take courage for I have overcome the world. And that's the very heart of this psalm this morning. So open with me, if you will, and we'll read together uh, these 12 verses. Psalm chapter 2. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? And the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then they will speak to them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. May the Lord bless his word and our time in it together. Psalm chapter 2 is this messianic psalm points us to the sovereignty and supremacy of the anointed Son of God, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. He alone is a refuge for all who look to him in faith. That's how it closes. It's said about 60% of Psalm chapter 2 is quoted throughout the New Testament, either directly or indirectly. Um, it is the most frequently quoted psalm in the New Testament. 
The psalm does not introduce itself as a psalm of David, but it is attributed to King David as inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly the way John and Peter describe the authorship of Psalm 2 in Acts chapter 4, verse 25. A psalm of David the king inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is a psalm of David, the little David, pointing us to uh, the true David, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As for a brief outline in Psalm chapter 2, it has 12 verses in four stanzas, three verses in each stanza. We see verses 1 through 3, the first stanza, David questions the rebellion of the nations against the Lord with the voice of the rebellious kings and rulers joining as a chorus against God in verse 3. The second stanza is through verses and verses 4 through 6. The Lord God calmly sits on his throne in heaven and he gives his reply. Verses 7 through 9 is the uh, third stanza. The third scene, God's anointed one now speaks. He reveals the preordained purposes of God in the final judgment for the wicked, for those who reject him. Verse, uh, verses 10 through 12 is the final stanza, the fourth stanza. The psalmist's voice now re-enters into the scene, and David gives a warning, almost an evangelical warning, an invitation, a plea to repentance. Do homage to the Son. Kiss the Son, your, your translation may say. He alone is the refuge. Um, that's the outline of Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter 2. And between Psalm chapter 1 and chapter 2, we see the entire book of the Psalms uh, flows from it. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are known as the preface of the entire book. And together, they set the foundation for, for the Psalms that we have. Um, and really pointing us to Christ and pointing us to who we are apart from Christ and who we are in Christ and what we have in Him, in the Messiah, in the Anointed One. And Psalm chapter 1 contrasts the way of the wicked and the way of the righteous. And then Psalm 2 contrasts the wicked with the, with the Anointed One who is the covenant head of the righteous. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who alone is righteous in, him, in himself. Psalm chapter 1 begins with, How blessed, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor sit in the path of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Psalm chapter 2 ends with how blessed. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm chapter 1 ends with a warning for the wicked. But the way of the wicked will perish. And Psalm chapter 2 begins with a warning for the wicked. And the warning is put in the form of a question. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? This question of David addresses the reality of, his, of the time that he, of, of what he faced, uh, really time and time again. Uh, and this is the reality of the people of God, what the people of God all throughout fallen mankind's history in every generation face, even to, to this day. Uh, we say, see it playing out uh, even, even today, in our own day. And the nations are constantly in an uproar. Why? The psalmist asks, why? Why are the nations in an uproar? The point of David's question here is not to seek an answer. He doesn't need to give an answer. It's, re it's rhetorical. It's a rhetorical question. In David's question, he exposes uh, the utter foolishness of man's rebellion. He gives the answer in his own question. It is as though David is astonished at the audacity uh, and even the insanity of the wicked, those who would rebel against their creator. It is all vanity. 
The uproar of the nations only leads to futility. The schemes of wicked men here, the pursuits of the rebellious, uh, it will all come to nothing. We say that phrase from time to time, it will all come to nothing. As false doctrine seeps into the church, it will all come to nothing. But that phrase itself is too passive, I think. It will not come to nothing, uh, but rather in God's sovereignty, the schemes of the wicked will be brought to nothing. The objectives of the wicked will never be achieved. Their objectives will never be achieved. Uh, it is utter futility. And that's the point. That's the point of the question. Psalm chapter 33, verse 10, in the King James Version, addresses it in this way. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices, the devices of the people of none effect. This is the insanity of the, rebellious, of the rebellion of sin before a sovereign God. And yet this is at the very core, at the heart of natural fallen man. Jeremiah 17, 9 uh, observes, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Desperately sick. And the sin of wicked men, the, the, the uproar of men and the nations is but insanity against a righteous and holy sovereign God. Yet despite the futility, natural man persists in its rebellion against God. We see in verse 2, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. They reject God the Father, and they reject His Son. They love not the Father, uh, and it is displayed in the rejection of His anointed one. And this is the view of fallen man towards the Creator and towards His revelation, towards His holy word, the insanity of sin. The uproar of the nations is aimed against their very Creator, against the Lord and against His anointed against the one who gave them life and breath and sustains their very, the very beat of their heart and sustains the, the very universe, creator and sustainer of all things. They have rage. They rage against him. They re rage against the God who gave them even their very positions of power and wealth and prestige. Rather than seeing the goodness of God, the abundant mercy and grace of God, who has given them life and breath and prospers them, they curse him and they curse his anointed. Against the Lord and against his anointed, they say together in unison, let us tear their fetters apart, cast away their cords from us. The fetter here they see as a, as a chain, a shackle to their feet. They view the character and nature of God in utter contempt. His holiness and his goodness are viewed as oppressive, as oppressive bondage. And they long, to, uh, they long for complete autonomy uh, from their very own creator, to be fully separated from him and become their own gods. Um, and but for grace, but for God's grace, his intervening and irresistible grace, that, that would be us. And it is by his irresistible grace that we can sing just the opposite. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Uh, he has changed our hearts to sing uh, to change the rage of natural man into praises. But fallen natural man sees the goodness of God and his character, his holiness, his righteousness as oppressive, uh, for they are altogether unlike him in every way uh, by nature. We see this very thing in Adam 
as he took and ate the fruit God had commanded not to eat. Adam was not the one deceived, but rather he was the one in willful rebellion took and ate to become like God himself. That was the deception, uh, the deceptive temptation in the garden. The serpent said, indeed, he questions God's word. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? You surely, later, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, that your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so Adam ate and he was right there. He desired to be like God. He viewed the vast provisions of God that God had given there in the garden in contempt uh, and viewed his word as oppressive, as oppressive bondage. And he rebelled against that. He desired to be wise in his own eyes. And so he took and ate. And this is how the fallen world looks upon the sovereign Lord and his anointed one, longing to be liberated from God, liberated from his commands. For his statutes, his word is burdensome and cumbersome, but they know not what they ask. Uh, their minds are darkened and the hearts are given over to further darkness, uh, to more darkness. That's Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, I'll read. It's a lengthy text, but it's applicable here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and the birds of the air and, and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The rebellious uproar of the nations, the threats of the kings and the rulers of the earth are of no threat to God and no threat to his redemptive plan. In fact, their rebellion uh, is the means of which God uses in his sovereignty to accomplish his redemptive purpose. The rebellion is of no threat to the kingship of his anointed one. And to highlight the vanity and other futility of fallen man's rebellion, the Lord answers in verse 4, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. The schemes of the wicked, the uproar of the nations are of no threat uh, to the Lord and no threat to his purpose. He alone is sovereign over the nations. And indeed, the earth is but a footstool as he sits on the throne in the heavens. That's the picture there. The, the nations may rage around us against the Lord, against God, against his anointed. But where do we see God here? He is seated on his throne in heaven. Our own earthly rulers here in our own nation may scheme against the Lord and may scheme against his people, but the Lord is on his throne and he laughs at their vanity. He laughs at their, scoffs at their futility. Psalm chapter 36, verse 12 through 15. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him. For he sees his day coming, 
The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy, to slay those who are upright in conduct. Their sword will enter their own heart and their bows will be broken. Better is a little, better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless and their inheritance will be forever. The wicked rage against his people because they rage against the Lord. Jesus says they do not persecute, they persecute you, they persecute me. And so if we see persecution for our faith, it is Christ who is being persecuted in us. Um, the Lord scoffs at them because he knows that their day is coming. The day of judgment where his just wrath will be poured out upon the wicked will come. And it will come suddenly and it will come quickly. And it will come through the very one whom they have rejected. And the only, uh, the only, only then will the wicked realize the full force of what they had uh, yearned for and hoped for. And they will realize the full force of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's what we see in verse 5. And he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. That is the answer of the Lord. The wicked devise their schemes against the Lord, but it has no effect in achieving their objective. It all comes to nothing, and indeed it is used for the objective that God has ordained beforehand. Cannot thwart God's design. In fact, the Lord uses these schemes to accomplish his very purpose. We see this at the very best at the first advent of Christ in his coming. The schemes of rulers rejecting the Messiah was sovereignly used for our own redemption to provide that redemptive price paid by the blood of the Lamb. The rejection of wicked men God has turned to his glory and praise and for his people to redeem us uh, from that very state. Verse 6, as for me, the Lord replies, I have, installed, um, I have installed my king upon Zion, my, my holy mountain. So certain is this future event that the Lord speaks of it in past tense. For his plans were established in eternity past, before the foundations of the world, in his son, uh, the anointed one of God, the son of God. In verse 2, the kings and rulers rage against the Lord and against his anointed. And here in verse 6, we see that the true king, the anointed one, has already been installed. The picture of the anointed one, uh, the practice of acknowledging him as a rightful king, um, came through a ceremony. The anointed uh, rightful king would be anointed with oil. We see this in 1 Samuel 16, 13, where the Lord reveals to Samuel that David uh, is the, the one who will be king. And he anoints David's head with oil, uh, from a, uh, with a horn of oil as future king of Israel. Here, the lesser David is writing of the greater David, the true anointed one, the one in which David is a type, is fulfilled in this anointed one. This word, the anointed one, uh, means the Messiah in, in the Hebrew. It is the Messiah. Uh, it is the Christ in the New Testament. Uh, the one who is king of kings, sovereign over all rulers, is fulfilled in the Davidic covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ the greater David. Um, and now the third stanza, he is the one, the anointed one now speaks. This is the Messiah, the Christ, the greater David, replies in verse 7, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. 
we see the decree of the Lord God at the baptism of Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We see the same utterance, similar utterance uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is the begotten one of God. He is begotten, not created, the unique son of God, fully God and yet fully man. John writes of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. In the first advent, the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one, came to his own, but his own rejected him. In John chapter 1, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Indeed, the anointed one had come, has come in the first advent. He was despised and rejected. Uh, the kings and the rulers devised their plans against him. They rejected him, the only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth. Jesus tells his disciples, whoever hates me, hates my father. We see that here. They mock the Lord God, and they mock his anointed one. And yet the stone which the builders rejected be, has become the very cornerstone, the great humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ in his first advent resulted in a great exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that, not that he was exalted in a higher place than he already was, for he is the son of God, but that he is realized, his exaltation is realized uh, by the, uh, the inheritance of nations given to him. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11, uh, we quote often in the Lord's Supper, and it is appropriate here as well. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That was the first advent. For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name, the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see the Father and the Son here displayed, and the Son uh, sits at his throne, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. The great reward for the Lamb that was slain in the first advent is the inheritance of nations, of all peoples, of every tongue, tribe, and nation. Verse 8, ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. We see that clearly in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain to purchase for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. The very ends of the earth are his possession. In a sense, yes, the, son, the nations are given to the Lord Jesus Christ in his redemptive purpose as his inheritance by his grace and mercy. Uh, uh, that is what we experience on this side of grace. Uh, as recipients, not by our merit, but by his loving kindness. But the uh, nations are also given to the Son in judgment, those who reject him. Um, and that is what we see here in verse 9. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Psalm chapter 10, 
uh, Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. This is the end of all who rebel against the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first advent, the anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to bring peace. Uh, he came to make that sweet exchange at the cross. His righteousness for our sinfulness. Uh, he put upon himself our sin. He became sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. But in the second advent, the Messiah will return not on a colt in peace, but on a white horse he will return. Not as a suffering servant that has been accomplished, but he will return as a conquering king. And it is imminent. He will not return with an olive branch, but he will return with a sword in his hand. We see that in Revelation chapter 19. If you'll turn with me, um, we can read and look there. Psalm chapter, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 19. From verses 11 through 16. And this is what the psalmist is looking to uh, in the future. And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes, his eyes are flamed of fire, and his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him that no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a blood, with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the, tr the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, are following him. We're following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he will strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh has the name written, King of King, Lord of Lords. Up to this point, we have spoken, I've spoken of the wicked uh, as a distant party, away from myself, away from, from you in this audience. But the reality is, that was me. And this is what I deserve, but for the grace of God. For those who are in Christ, we can all say, but for the grace of God, there go I we would still be in that condition. Paul reminds the Corinthians uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And so, but for the grace of God, there go we. But we need not fear for Christ has paid the price. The grace of God, but for the grace of God, there go I. But we were rescued with weapons in hand through the gospel. And this is what David now offers as a warning to the kings and judges on the earth to turn to the Lord in verses 10 through 12. The final stanza. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. He closes with that command, that warning, that plea, so to speak, to those judges and the kings that rebel against their creator to show discernment, to take warning, to worship the Lord 
with reverence and rejoice with trembling, with awe and reverent fear. Come before the Lord, um, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. Do homage to the Son. Kiss the Son. We see here the picture of the King, the King of Kings, and we see the invitation for the kings of the earth and the ruler of the earth to bow low, to kiss the hand of the king, to do homage to the son. How do we do that? How, how does one do homage to Christ? How does one kiss the son in a way that is pleasing to God? It is simple. It is simple and yet it is impossible for natural man. We do homage to the Son through faith. It is through faith by grace. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, verses, verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who for he uh, for he for he who comes to God must believe and that he is, and he is a rewarder for all who seek him. Romans 5, verse 1, Paul writes. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained our instruction by faith into this grace in which we stand. For those who are apart from Christ, flee, flee to him. He alone is our refuge. He alone is the refuge for the wicked, the refuge in which we rest through faith, by his grace in his son, his anointed one. For he has borne the wrath, the just wrath of God due unto our sin in Christ himself. First John chapter two, uh, first John chapter two, um, a much misunderstood text and misused text, but a text that is appropriate here. For he himself is a propitiation for he himself, the anointed one of God, is the wrath-bearing substitute, satisfying the full wrath of God as a propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, not for ours only, but for those of the whole world, the whole world without distinction, men and women of every tongue, tribe, and nation, of every class, both the king and the, the slave, uh, are to bow low in faith and do homage to the Son. And how blessed are those who take refuge in Him, is how the psalmist closes. My oldest daughter is reading uh, The Hiding Place by Corey Tim Boone. And in that book, you see in that time period, we, we know the nations are in an uproar. Um, the kings and the rulers are devising a vain thing against God. We see Corey Tim Boone in that, in that book. She, she quotes, she says, We have nothing to fear because Christ, because Jesus is victor. He will never let us down. With Jesus, even our darkest moments, the best remains. And the very best is yet to be. That is the hope of the people of God who take refuge in the anointed one. So how shall we now live in light of these great truths as saints in Christ as we consider Christ's return? That we are secure in him and we have refuge in him. Uh, Peter gives in his closing uh, comments to the church. Um, he is uh, inspired by the Lord. Uh, this is the word of God, but he, he, he leaves this church, he leaves the church, the saints, in this context of how we ought to live in light of these truths of the day of the Lord coming in chapter 3, uh, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. 
and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which the righteous dwells. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ is a refuge to those who rest in him. He is a refuge. Christ himself is a refuge against the kings, against the raging kings upon his people in trials and tribulation. In this world, we will have trouble, but take courage. Our hope is in Christ who has overcome the world. But here, Christ is a refuge from the very wrath of God. And so we look, we can look forward to the second coming of Christ with hopefulness, with confidence. Um, yes, with fear and trembling, but that fear is not a fear of, of a terrified fear, but of awe and reverence. Not so for the enemies of God, for the terror which they will face will only be realized. And they do not realize it until that day. So if you are apart from Christ, look to him, turn to him, for he alone is a refuge, and a refuge from the wrath of God to come. For he has paid the price on the cross, satisfied that wrath in his own work. Look to him. And for those who are in Christ, look to him. Look to his second coming and walk in fear and reverence to God with lives that are holy and blameless in these great truths. Well, our aim was to look to Christ in uh, edification and encouragement. So take courage. The, uh, he turns the, the wrath of men to praise him. And by grace, we are testaments to that. Each one here is a miraculous testament to the work of God in our life, who has changed objects of wrath now to objects of his grace and loving kindness in the person and work of his anointed one. And so we kiss the Son, we do homage to Him this day and going forward. Uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank You for these magnificent truths that You would send Your Son to condescend to empty Himself for a countless many, Your elect people of God, to redeem sinful people as your inheritance and your possession, um, a great number that no man can count, and not a single drop of his redemptive blood was spilled in waste. His atonement, his purchase payment, uh, in accordance to your will, uh, satisfies and completes and fulfills all your redemptive purpose for your people. Not one is lost. And so we thank you. We thank you for the obedience of your son, who for this joy set before him endured the cross to redeem a people such as us. We look to him in faith. Uh, we kiss the son. We do homage through faith justified through faith by your grace. We thank you and we praise you uh, for that gift. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.